Rather weep for yourselves, for the day shall come when it will say, they will say, blessed are the barren. And he was quoting from Isaiah chapter 54 in saying this, remaining barren in as much not as taking, in as much as not participating in the reign of the spurious Christ when he would come in and pretend to have a wedding and um, there will be many that will not be barren as it is written in Mark 13 where he would say, woe to those that are with child. That's what he was talking about. And he said, marvel not if they will do this to the green tree. That means if they will do this while I have blood in my veins, think what they will do to the dry tree or that is to say to the Holy Spirit. Uh, that is to say people in general, especially those that are biblically illiterate. And of course, that's in Luke. I was quoting from Luke 23, starting with about verse 28. So let's pick it up with a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's precious name, chapter 19, verse 18, and it reads, Where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side uh, one, and Jesus in the midst. Now, of course, um, <clears throat> I mentioned when we were reading Isaiah 53, we went ahead and read uh, down to, I believe it's the ninth verse, whereby you could understand he was buried with the rich, but he died with the malefactors. That means prophecy must come to pass as it's written. And these things should encourage your faith to know it always happens exactly as it's written. Therefore, it is paramount at whatever works best for you is to know the prophecies, to know what tomorrow brings. And you're, you're amazed then at how that alleviates any anxiety that you might have about the future. You're anxious for it. Let it come, bring it on. And um, uh, because you, you already know from our Father's word as he has foretold us all things. That is to say, if you've taken the time to check it out. Verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. He, he still, he tried his best to get them to excuse Christ and let him go free. So this was more or less done as a slam because he found out it really upset them if he called Christ a king. So he wrote on the cross and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, oh, how they hated that name Nazareth. Nothing good ever came from Nazareth, they would say. Um, the king of the Jews, and of course he was king of all Israel, but he puts it there, and guess what? Verse 20, this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. That is to say, Pilate's mocking those that insisted on his death, and Pilate could find nothing wrong. I'm sure that he marveled at religion, and perhaps it would do all of us good if occasionally we as Pilate, if we could put ourselves in that place, to stand back and look at religions. And they are kind of a marvel. We had a man executed here in Arkansas last evening and uh, a holy clown from another so-called religion. Now, he was a Buddhist, I'll say it. Uh, this man had murdered his um, in-laws, mother-in-law and father-in-law for no reason. And this monk or chipmunk or whatever you want to call him, Holy Joe, gets up and says, the state of Arkansas just murdered a good man. He shows his ignorance. So it, it does you good to stand back and look because I marvel at that. What kind of religion would say something like that and show their ignorance publicly as to how God has written the difference between murder and to execute someone on two faithful witnesses? I marvel. Amazing. I know that may offend some, be that as it may. If it, the shoe fits, put it on, wear it. But um, 
this this thing of religion to, in Pilate's eyes, I'm sure was foolish because he was strictly p political, all right? So, but still, being a judge of the people in the political sense, as a governor, he ruled fair in as much as, as best he could because he did want to let Jesus go. Okay, enough said, verse 21. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. He, he, he was very unhappy about that. And of course, you know who the chief priest was, that is old Caiaphas. He wasn't a chief priest appointed by God, but by a Roman governor, 22. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. He was through with it. He had washed his hands of it. 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, that this was probably not regular troops, but it was conscripts that, that were hired to do the execution work. They, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. So we know there were four of them there. And also his coat. Now the coat was without a seam, woven from the top throughout. Now, very few might know what a coat like that belonged to. A coat like that belonged to the chief priest. And Christ was a chief priest after the order of Melchizedek. It was woven all in one piece for a very simple reason. Seams catch lint or foreign particles or anything else when he might go into the Holy of Holies. But it's important that you note that with the four being there, what is, what is the number four? What, is it, what does it signify? Earth. They were of the earth and they were Gentiles. And if probably... Um, considered by God to be basically, um, in as much as they had not learned, um, innocent in that sense, but certainly not saved if you are, if you think that's what I'm trying to say, it isn't, all right? They're fulfilling prophecy, and I'll document it in a moment. Verse 24, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it but cast lots for it. It was beautiful. Whose it shall be that the scripture, uh, colon, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, don't ever, don't ever, when you note a scripture that says, whereby the scripture might be fulfilled. It's paramount in that you should go, that you should check it out. What's happening here? I imagine even as Christ looks down, we'll pick it up in a moment, and sees this. Because he would soon say, in, and it is written in other gospels, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene. Which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Jesus, as you noticed from the 17th chapter of this book of John, never calls our Father God. Always calls him Father. So, what you should know then, being familiar with the scriptures, he's quoting Psalms 22. Well, why would he quote Psalms 22? Because it's a prophecy concerning the crucifixion. I want to turn there with you. I think any time that you see whereby the scriptures must be fulfilled, you should turn there, and I assure you, you will always learn more than is written in the particular scripture that guides you to that 22nd Psalm. And um, it, this is the way Christ teaches. He would have, for the sake of time, naturally, the sentence, God never forsook Christ. Let me say that. Anytime you hear some preacher teaching that, he doesn't know what he's talking about, quite frankly. I don't know how other to put it than that. It shows how uneducated he is in the Word of God. Because Christ on the cross was quoting Psalms 22, whereby you would know that 
the prophecy and the crucifixion were written of long, many, many years, almost a thousand years before the event came to pass, and yet it's written in detail of exactly what happened on that hill called Skull, even down to Christ's last words on the cross, it is finished or it is done. It's according to which language you're speaking. He would continue following after the Eli Eli, which is verse one. He would go on down through and repeat the words that people would be saying as they walked by that road, for it was near the road, and repeat the words of the high priest that the priest would say, I don't know why I said that. And of course it was the Holy Spirit fulfilling this 22nd Psalm. I want to pick it up, if I may, in about the 14th verse, and let's go with it in this Psalms 22, and see if you can recognize the events that are transpiring in the Passion, which is to say the crucifixion. Verse 14, Psalms 22, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels, or from within me. Why wouldn't your, your um, bones be out of joint if you're nailed to a cross and your weight is hanging down on your arms out parallel from the body? Eventually it pulls the shoulders out of joint. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, like an old piece of broken pottery and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. That means almost at the end of the day or when it's due. For dogs, which is to say, my enemies have compassed me. Oh, everyone had left uh, practically, um, except a few we'll get to here in a moment. And um, he was alone on that cross with two malefactors. The assembly of the wicked hath enclosed me. Remember the cries, crucify him. They pierced my hands and my feet. And then you have some that would teach, well, it's not written anywhere that Christ should be crucified. And it shows how biblically illiterate even some of the revolving revs are. Verse 17. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. 18, they part my garments among them, four ways, right? And cast lots upon my vesture. You see, this should strengthen your faith in God's word, that it comes to pass exactly as it's written. That's why it's important for you to understand the book of Revelation, which means the revealing. The revealing of what? What tomorrow brings. What your duties are. If you are saved, so to speak. Well, I didn't know saved people had to do anything. Somebody that doesn't have to do anything is not worth anything. God has a purpose for everything. Does he for you? Verse 19. But be not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. And he was, don't worry. 20, deliver my soul from the sword. My darling, the same word darling as soul is above and translate it soul from the power of the dogs, my enemies. 21, save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. In the Hebrew, the wild ox. There's no such thing as a unicorn. 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That should be familiar to you, for I quoted Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, the purpose Christ came to this earth for in the flesh, to destroy death, which is to say, Satan, the devil, as it is written in the 14th verse, but begin reading at the 12th verse in Hebrews chapter 2 in the New Testament, and you will have this verse affixed there. And this is what we do. We share the story, the report, the history to the family, which is the congregation. Verse 23, ye that fear the Lord, that is to say, love him, revere him, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, 
all ye the seed of Israel. And there that sign over his head, placed there by a heathen, if you would, named Pilate. Verse 24, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, he always does. 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Again, that revere him, love him. 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. That's to say the humble. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. I don't know, do you seek him? It's your choice, you see. There, there are conditions throughout God's word. Many people take it for granted. Oh, I just have to believe and that's it. No, you have to take that step. You have to seek. Well, how do I seek? In his word, by studying his word. Now, this is a very important part. And while we're here, we're going to go ahead and cover it. Because it speaks, I want to document to you that not only did he think of you as he was walking up the hill, but as he was on the cross. Listen to the words. All the ends of the world shall remember. You might even translate it at the end of this world age. Shall remember and turn it to the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. On the first day of the millennium there at the end, every knee shall bow. 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. Your new world order, hey, the Satan's one world system, forget it. There's only one king, and he was crucified. But he did not die. He's coming again, and this time as king of kings and lord of lords. 29, all they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. You can't dream up your own salvation. Oh, yes, we can, because we're going to fly away. That's what was dreamed up in the year 1830. Have you checked it out? It's real easy. It's going to happen like it's written in detail, like dividing the vesta and then gambling for the cloak. 30, this is to you. A seed shall serve him. That's children. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Do you know what generation it is of the fig tree? You can read of it in Mark chapter 13. It's the last generation. 31. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness. The fact that he's fair and right unto a people that shall be born. That is to say, umbilical cord to umbilical cord to the end. That he hath done this. That he hath done this is the equivalent in the Greek to it is finished. Those were his words on the cross. Those were his words as he said those words reported in another gospel. Ila, ila, lama shabatane. Perfect Hebrew with the exception of one Aramaic verb quoting Psalms 22, to take you there, whereby you could see the arms outstretched, pierced, the joints from socket, to know what he had done for you. That's why they were gambling for his clothing, so that you could know. Our father knew nearly a thousand years before exactly how it would come to pass, because it was his plan of salvation for you. For you and for the rest of his children. But he shows no partiality to those children. All right, let's return, if we may, to chapter 19 in the great book of St. John, chapter 25. And it reads as the, after the report of the soldiers gambling. 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, that's to say his mother, Mary, and his mother's sister, this would be Salome, which is to say it would be John's mother, and Mary, the wife of Cleopas, this would be the third woman mentioned, and Mary Magdalena, there were four. 26, 
When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that is to say John, the writer of this gospel, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And within that, when you come to the realization of what her son was doing at that moment, the greatest gift that man ever received, and she, the mother, the one that had brought him in, the only begotten son, into this flesh body, 27. Then said he to the disciple, which would be John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. His own mother, Shalom, and Mary, the mother of Christ, and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalena. Uh, he took them away from the place. Why? Basically, that's what Christ was indicating. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, listen carefully, that the scripture might be fulfilled. You see how important it was? Why was it important? So that you could see that he's not going to leave anything out promised to you. What he promises, he keeps. So now wishing to fulfill it, he said, I thirst. And do you realize that he's quoting scripture again so that all of them would be fulfilled? Do you know where that scripture is? You'll find it in the book of Psalms 69. Let's turn there quickly. Don't want you to miss this. Everything on cue, exactly as it was written, he, shall we say engineering it from the cross exactly as it would come to pass Nothing by accident, my friend. But it was written long ago exactly how the crucifixion would take place. Verse 21 of Psalm 69. Verse 21 reads, They gave me also gall for my meat. That would have been the first time in another gospel. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Verse 22. Listen carefully. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare or blessing, let it become a trap. In other words, the final trap to that generation is taking Antichrist for the true Christ. That is to say, to believe that instead of Jesus is Jesus indeed. In other words, their own Christianity becomes their trap because they're biblically illiterate. They don't know what's written. That was said whereby you, followers of Christ, followers of the passion, knowing it was for you, could understand what the words, I thirst, means. And you had better thirst for God's word. Verse, uh, let's return to John 19, and you're already familiar with verse 29 because we just read it in the Old Testament. 29 reads uh, in chapter 19, St. John. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Now, in another gospel, they had done this once before with gall, which is a drug that they tried to give him. He refused it. Did he allow them to put this to his lips? Well, vinegar is a poor man's wine, okay? Uh, that's what it's talking about here. It's not vinegar as you know it today. It's probably the old, the old boys gambling down there were drinking it, had it with them. Again, a poor man's wine. So why do I do that? So that you see that the Old Testament is important, that it is our school teacher, that it brings these points forth whereby we may see them and ensure and strengthen our faith in him, knowing everything comes to pass as it's written. And we might just take an example. 
example, the parable of the fig tree, how that this nation would come to be in this final generation, and it happened in 1948. And the events concerning the alignments of the nations have fallen in place exactly as they are written since that time. Verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. And there it was. He, the flesh expired, and the spirit naturally instantly returned to the Father that gave it, which also is the last verse of Psalms 22, the equivalent in the Hebrew, It is done. Isn't it beautiful how perfect God's Word is when you read it with understanding? Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, this is why that many people, knowing that Christ must be in the tomb three days and three nights, because the word Sabbath is used here and they are not familiar with the old feast days, whatever day Passover falls on, it is a high Sabbath regardless of what day of the week it is, all right? On the year that this crucifixion took place, the high Sabbath fell on a Thursday. And don't let that, don't let that throw you total. It was a Sabbath. Thursday of the week of the cru crucifixion was a Sabbath. So, he was crucified on Wednesday. The new day begins at sundown, reckoning on the Hebrew calendar. Do you want me to say that again? Not at midnight, but at sundown, the new day begins. So Wednesday ends at sundown, and they wanted to get them from the cross before it was dark or sundown on Wednesday because that started the high Sabbath, which was on a Thursday. So he was placed in the tomb Thursday, beginning of the day, one night. Now, when it came what we call Thursday sundown, that began the second night. Let's just say the second day. Thursday at sundown began the second day. Friday at sundown began the third day. And then he arose sometime in the night after the sunset on Saturday. Um, that is not written, and we don't know exactly, but he was there. I mean, God doesn't make mistakes. He was there a full, three full days and three full nights, and arose sometime after sundown, which would be the part of um, another day. So there it was, and the resurrection took place. So I want to say that because so many people You'd be surprised how many times I received that question of how could he have been placed in this tomb on Friday night and resurrected on Sunday and have been there three days and three nights? Well, he wasn't. Because every time there is a feast day such as Passover or Feast of Tabernacles or Pentecost, it's a Sabbath, all right? It's called a Sabbath day. And it is illustrated and drawn to your attention if you understand from the fact that it said it was an high day because Passover is the highest day in Christianity. It was the day that our Savior defeated death. It is the day that he was the Passover lamb on that specific Passover. And it is the day that he became our Passover. And that's why you should always call that feast in the spring, Passover, and not something else. That's what the manuscripts call it. Verse 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. 33. But when they came to Jesus, 
and saw that he was dead already, they broke not, break not his legs. You see, if they had a, scripturally, he would not have been a perfect sac sacrifice, uh, um, uh, that is to say, symbolically speaking. The scriptures had to be fulfilled that he would be perfect with no broken bone. You don't, you don't offer a sacrifice lamb with a broken leg to God, all right? Verse 33, but when they came to Jesus, they, they saw that, uh, that he was dead. They break not his legs, 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now it's very important. What he, what he pierced was the uh, pericardium, that is to say the sac in which the heart itself is in. And it's important that you understand that both the blood and the water came forth. He was dead, all right? You see, some people teach he didn't die, that he had been drugged on the cross and they revived him later and that was it. Not so. It documents that he was dead. That is to say the flesh was, 35. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that he saith true um, that he might believe. That is to say that he died on the cross. Don't listen to any fairy tales uh, that would teach otherwise. And they're out there, 36. For these things were done that the scripture, there you got it, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. I'm going to give you some scriptures at your home assignment. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. Numbers 9, 12. This is law pertaining to sacrifice. And Psalms 34, 20. Psalms 34, 20. This happened even down to the fact that he would give up the spirit at a time where it was not necessary that someone that would know nothing at all of the Torah, the Old Testament, would um, break one of those commandments written by God. Is it not amazing that God controls all of his children, whether they are heathen, believers, non-believers, or what have you? And his word always comes to pass as it's written. There are no accidents. Many might say, well, I found an arrow in God's Word. No, you didn't. You're the one that's an arrow because you don't understand what's written. You just think. There's only one way. Any, uh, the, you know, this should make a better student out of you. Anytime that in your mind the Word seems to contradict itself, you're not seeing the true picture. So dig and study and you may have to break it back to the original writing, but the word will not counterdict. Never has, never will. Always comes to pass exactly as it's written. Why? Your father loves you. Why? Well, because you're his child. He may not love some of the things you do, but he does love your soul. He created you for his pleasure. That's also scripture. And when you tell him that you love him, how much more could he give than to become Emmanuel, that is to say God with us, and allow himself to be nailed to a cross? Perfect he was, never sinned, die for you so that you can say, I repent, Father, forgive me, I love you. And, it's, and, and he forgives you every time when you mean it from your heart. Why? He loves you. So always take advantage and do revere him and let him know that you love him in return. Once you do that, think about it. All right, bless your heart. You know.